So everyone in chat, please welcome Dr. Ellen Wu, the Associate Pro uh, Professor of History at Indiana University. Maybe we'll start with this. Were you surprised um, at the end of, at, at the Supreme Court's decision? I was not surprised by the Supreme Court's decision. The plaintiffs were accusing Harvard of discriminating against Asian American applicants in particular by using uh, really kind of subjective measures of um, sort of individual, per like personal types of traits. Their allegation was that Harvard was using those kind of soft traits to basically put a cap on how many Asians they, you know, they might admit from year to year. So it's a very tiny piece in a way of, of affirmative action in a broader sense, right? I think it would be good to back up a little bit and look at, okay, who's behind the case, right? Abigail Fisher. This is a person who did not get into University of Texas and essentially said, I didn't get in because of race. And kind of the implication is that basically letting black and brown students in, that ended up getting rejected. Didn't work. But then what happened is uh, there is a essentially conservative legal activist named Edward Bloom who has kind of made a career out of picking up cases that align with things that he wants to push forward politically. And he'll find somebody that kind of matches up with this. It's like he found a good match because in the Texas case that you mentioned, um, that Abigail Fisher, she was a white, a young white woman, right? So then I think <laughs> at that time, because they lost at the Supreme Court, they kind of pivoted and thought if we could get like the the, the right people of color to sort of front yeah. the case or to be the face of the case uh, that we might have, like that is Blum and, and his operation might have better odds. Students for Fair Admissions, which is the group in question here, they put up a website called harvardnotfair.org and started seeking people to say, hey, do you have a complaint? Would you like to complain? And of course, you know, look at the front, Asian face slapped on the front and basically it says, hey, did you not get into Harvard? Do you think it's because of race? Send us an email. What we're about to watch is, uh, this is Kenny Shu, who is a, who's on the board of Students with Fair Admissions. The less narrative is that if you are a white person, you're privileged, or if you're a person of color, you're oppressed. But Asian Americans inconvenience that narrative because although they're a person of color and they have experienced racism and discrimination in this country, I think the recent wave of anti-Asian attacks prove that to be completely true. They have experienced racism. Um, they still perform at a level that is comparable to whites and even higher than whites. They inconvenience the narrative of the left because even though they're supposed to be oppressed and supposed to play victims, they actually, because of their culture and because of their educational skills and traits, are able to uh, achieve a modicum of middle class success in this country. So, and I. Yes, that right there. Notice the things that he says because of culture. Like, our culture, because of our cultural values, we have this success, right? And, and that's why it's because of culture. And then, okay, the question then becomes, well, okay, does, is there somebody else who doesn't have these cultural values and they're not successful? And of course the answer is black people don't. A lot of the folks uh, who are really invested in dismantling uh, of race-based admissions, you know, they're of more, they're more recent immigrants that have been able to come to the United States because the U.S. Revised its um, immigration mm. policies mm -hmm. in the 60s and let Asians in, and and also because of the civil rights movement, Black freedom movement, um, other kinds of reforms put into place. If we have like a big takeaway from this history and then this current affirmative action um, issue, really it's about how the history of Black Americans and Asian Americans are so deeply interconnected, and we really can't understand one group's history without taking into account the other. There's um, like a very common kind of phrase that we hear a lot associated with Asian Americans. That's, that's a so-called model minority myth or model minority stereotype. And I'm sure everybody in chat like totally um, would know, even if they don't know that phrase, it's just the stereotype that Asians are a certain kind of like good minority, you know, like they, they work hard, they're smart, 
they're pretty quiet. They don't rock the boat. Um, and they're fairly successful. They're, um, you know, they kind of encapsulate that American dream of, of immigrants, um, you know, working their way up the, the ladder and achieving that American dream. But that intersects also with, um, you know, the fact that they're also like people of color or minorities. And and so that that particular mythology of um, about Asian Americans really came out, uh, you know, it was a really recent invention from like the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Before that, Asians were completely despised. In fact, uh, uh, you know, ordinary Americans and policymakers just wanted to really banish them or exclude them, you know, completely shut them out from from the there United were laws States. for this, yeah. Like you, yeah, absolutely, absolutely can't not come in. Yeah, you can't come in. You can't become a naturalized citizen. You can't marry white folks. Uh, you can't own property. You know, shut out of lots of um, different, like hundreds of different kinds of jobs. Um, and so it's pretty grim. It's kind of like the West Coast cousin of Jim Crow. You know, in California, in Oregon, and uh, Washington, and so forth. And so things are pretty tough for Asian immigrants, um, really until that 1940s uh, World War II tipping point. And so in that really um, kind of this moment of great upheaval in American society, uh, the racial order kind of gets reshuffled. You know, the U.S. is aspiring to become this global leader. It's fighting these wars in the name of freedom and democracy. And so uh, racism, you know, racial segregation looks kind of like bad for the brand. And so in, in this moment, this new story about Asian Americans emerges as, again, being these kind of hard workers, good Americans, loyal, patriotic. And then by the 1960s, as the black freedom movement is really heating up and um, it becomes very clear, even after the passage of like the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act in 1964-65, that, that those laws alone will not solve this really... Uh, troubling and deep-rooted problem of, you know, racial discrimination against Black people, and that's where the model minority um, kind of story then kind of kind of you know really takes off because then it becomes a way for people to say, oh, either we liberals to say, oh, we can look to Asians as like a potential model of a solution for solving the problems of and you know anti-Black racism, or conserv then conservatives sort of uh, jump on the bandwagon and kind of redirect it to say, oh, black people, they should, you know, it's, it's, they should just take the lessons. Like they should um, learn from Asians, you know, why are you making all this noise and making these demands on, on the government? You know, you, it, it the problem is you, the problem is not us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and th these were conversations that are happening in the, you know, fifties and sixties which is clearly there's not an issue of racism or discrimination here because we have a minority that is doing just fine, big square quotes on the just fine. Yeah. And so what are you complaining about? All of you other groups, why don't you just go be more like them? Exactly. If we backtrack to World War II, you know, black Americans at the time had a campaign they called like a double V campaign. So yeah. they wanted victory abroad and victory at home. This idea of fair employment that that is like to um, open up that opportunity pipeline for uh, black workers in, in industry really takes hold. These different part, um, agencies in the executive branch, including some Asian American staff members, they start to formulate um, early sort of the early beginnings of affirmative action policy. And so it really begins with trying to open up opportunities for employment. And I think that's what we lose sometimes and fixating on like admissions to Harvard, you know, that really just uh, affects such a tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny such percentage tiny, yeah. of Americans, right? But the, there's so, the stakes are so much bigger in terms of, uh, you know, uh, employment and, and sort of other kinds of opportunities. This discussion is happening in chat, and I think it's important. We'd be remiss not yeah. to bring it up, and I'd love for you to dive into this, Ellen. The the um, idea of a monolith, right? What does that mean? Like, how does that affect this? How are people using that word, those words, to really push a narrative, right? Okay, yeah, so a monolith is sort of like, you know, so putting everybody in the same bucket, right? And assuming everybody in the bucket is like, ha is exactly the same or pretty close. And so I think one of the, again, kind of unintended or ironic outcomes of um, civil rights policy and affirmative action policy is that you, like groups, groups have to be put in certain sort of buckets, you know, based on racial identity. 
Um, and, and that was because in order to kind of prove and track and correct racial discrimination, there, there had to be a way to sort of a metric system in a way, oh. right? Like you have to kind of document it and then be able to kind of um, count it and sort of fix it. Um, and so, um, you know, before, you know, in, in the 1960s, there was a small group, there was a small movement of Asian we would call them today Asian Americans, Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino Americans who came together, called themselves really in a lot of ways for the very first time as Asian Americans. And um, soon included other folks like Samoans, um, Chamorros, uh, South Asians, uh, uh, Southeast Asians, but they started to call themselves Asian Americans. And at that time it was a very um, intentional sort of political identity. It was, uh, they, they had a very anti-racist worldview and they were actually anti-imperialist. They were the two um, inspirations for the Asian American movement of the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s were black power and the anti-war movement, like anti-Vietnam, Southeast Asian wars. Um, and that, because of this kind of emerging affirmative action uh, sort of um, policies in federal government and then later like in corporations and universities, they start to organize themselves as Asian Americans and really push for you know, affirmative action for Asian Americans, um, resources for Asian Americans, et cetera, et cetera. Their numbers were very small then. So I think strategically coming together as Asian Americans in one kind of monolithic label made sense because there were just so few of them. But the population has exploded since the 1960s and the 70s. And it's like super diverse today. It's it's over 20 million people, you know, and it's diverse in every way that you could think, not just socioeconomically or culturally, but, you know, ideologically, as we've seen, people have many different kinds of political yeah. positions. And, and another thing that people are talking about in chat also is is class is huge in, in this, right? And I think there's, there's this whole series of questions that I think this ruling ends up it, it's not quite addressing them, I don't think, because, you know, we're, we're talking about Harvard. People who are elite, who go to the elite institution to create more elite cop carbon copies of themselves for the most part. Like a, f a few more people of a certain background going to Harvard, a few less people going to Harvard. Is that going to make America a good place to live? Is that going to improve the lives of most Americans? I think probably not, but it seems like we're so hyper-focused on that, right? It's it's in, I think it's a regrettable in a lot of ways that really what we need to expend our energy on is a much broader sort of you know frame of of yeah these big questions of fairness equality and opportunity and how it will have the widest reaching impact. I mean, if you're applying to Harvard, even if you don't get in, I'm pretty sure you'll be getting into some other fancy school. You know, so that <laughs> that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. It's a self-selecting group. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there are lots of Asian Americans who go to community colleges and lots of Americans of all races, for that matter. Um, you know, our public schools certainly, you know, need to be better funded and our teachers better paid. There's all there's I think our energies ought to be more focused on these sort of more. I think in a way that is more democratic and equitable, the, the kinds of education policies that would again, open up, widen that opportunity pipeline for the most people. That's actually a really good question. Who wins here? If the argument was that Asian Americans are being discriminated against, you know, at, at Harvard specifically, right? We're talking about this specific case. Well, if that was happening and that is, is being removed, then do Asian Americans win here? I personally do not think this is a victory for Asian Americans. I think it's, it's like the opposite, actually, because I think it's really undermined a lot of important, you know, really decades of coalition work that Asian Americans have put in a lot of effort into, uh, into supporting, um, you know, kind of working with other communities of color and to build a stronger democracy, you know, and a more uh, welcoming society where everybody actually feels like they belong and have, have a shot at the good life. It's a setback for Asian Americans, but the silver lining for me is that it in some ways really shows, in, in some ways it goes against the model minority myth, because part of the model minority myth is all about how Asians keep quiet and they put their heads down, they don't engage. But what we have actually seen is Asian Americans uh, you know, investing and mobilizing on on, on both sides of the affirmative action debate, sure, um, yeah. uh, and and really just sort of as political actors. So 
it does show us that, um, you know, Asian Americans are not like apolitical, but that actually we care deeply, um, not only about education, it's not just getting into Harvard, but it's like, yeah. you know, climate change, it's a uh, health care, it's, it's the whole gamut of things. And, and I really hope that other people will understand that Asian Americans, um, yeah, that we are, we, we do care about this country. We, we are politically sort of active, you know, and, and it's, um, we're a community that has a lot of potential if, if we can kind of harness it for the greater good.